I'm Davey, and this is the path to senior, or to senior. Um, I have to apologize. I'm afraid the acoustics in this room may be too good, um, so I apologize for how well you're going to be able to hear. Um, and on another note, I started to move all my slides from keynote to deck set, and I only got about halfway through. So I'm actually going to have to switch presentation software in the middle of this. So my apologies for that. So what is a senior developer? This talk is framed as the search for a definition of senior developer. Why do you care? It's unlikely that Billy on the street is going to shove a microphone in your face and ask you for the definition. If you don't think you're a senior developer yet and you want to be one though, it's probably helpful to know what that even means. If you happen to be trying to hire a senior developer, which I am, then it's also good to know what you're looking for. It can help you clarify your needs. And if you say what to apply to be a senior developer somewhere, which you should, um, it's good to know what people might be looking for. And even if you know you're not there yet, um, it's good to know what you're aiming for. Well, I wanted to say a little more about that, I guess. I thought I had another slide about this. Um, even if you are already a senior developer and you know it, we all have room to grow, right? Um, so by breaking down this definition a little bit, it's helpful, I think, in your quest for self-improvement as a developer and to some degree as a human being to give some thought to some of these things. So it's not just about that quest to get a senior in front of your job title. So the most obvious trait that a senior developer would need to possess is probably technical capability, right? Different people no doubt define senior developer differently, but I think everyone agrees that developers need to learn the tech. So once you've identified this as an area in which you want to grow, how do you grow? What specifically do you need to work on? We'll dig into this a little more later, but uh, Tony Dewan uh, came up with some guidelines that I like. He created his scale of awesomeness for his web development students. It's a pretty good general purpose tool to measure the quality of a developer's work. So without worrying so much about the definition of senior developer, here are just some good guidelines for judging whether you're doing good stuff. This is the scale, and that's Tony. Not to scale. <laughs> Does it work? Does it work well? Could it work better? Could it work elsewhere? First on the scale, does it work? Does it meet the functional requirements? Great, Tony would tell his students. You'll probably pass if you can uh, meet that criterion. Outside of a classroom, you probably won't get fired. Probably. This is not supposed to be there. Yeah, you might not be fired. But what do you think of someone who only does the bare minimum? We have higher standards than that for ourselves. Making it work is the absolute minimum. That is very little flair indeed. So next, don't oh, come on. Does it work well? Is the user experience acceptable? Behold, the Norman door. Named after the inspiration of Don Norman's classic book, The Design of Everyday Things. A door so bad, a psychologist had to write a book. The door may open, so it works, but the user experience is unforgivably bad. If you can make things that work and work well, Tony says, you'll probably get a good grade. Outside the classroom, people may like you. Yes, even you. The folks in sales and marketing, maybe even customers. Other developers on your team may still hate you though. There's still work to do. And by the way, anytime I refer to other developers, that means you in a few weeks. So, yeah, it works. Maybe it even works well. Could it work better? In other words, can it be maintained? Holy smokes, quit skipping slides. Cuss Ranger. Can it be maintained? Can it be maintained? Can it be refactored? What's refactored? 
Refactoring is the process of restructuring existing code without changing its behavior. Is that even possible? Is it written in such a way that there's any hope of doing that without breaking a bunch of stuff? And code is read much more often than it's written. So can anyone else read your code? Can everyone else read your code? Great, you'll probably get a job, he says to his students. Outside the classroom, maybe you'll get a raise. But I'll be frank, this poop's difficult. It can take longer to learn to write readable code than it takes you to learn to make things that work well. This is really hard stuff and you kind of never stop learning. I've been doing this an embarrassingly long time and sometimes it's still a serious challenge to take my code from working and working well to being readable by others. That makes it really tempting to get lazy and just ship your code once it works well. Learn to resist that temptation though and your coworkers and your future self will thank you. Have you ever written code and looked back at it a month later and had no idea what on earth you were thinking when you wrote that? <laughs> yep. Remember, the developer who helped by, me, by writing maintainable code, maybe you. Last point on Tony's scale, could it work elsewhere? Can it be reused? Oftentimes the same solution can fit multiple problems with only minor variations. The ability to write code in such a way that it can be used in multiple situations is indispensable. Putting this another way, can it be packaged and shared? We often find ourselves using libraries that other people wrote, right? What if we wrote a library and shared it with the world? Like whoever wrote that upsert gem uh, that Stephen was showing probably had to solve that problem for a specific thing they were working on but they wrote it in such a way that other people can use it too. It didn't just solve the problem at hand, it was general purpose. So being able to write stuff like that and sharing it with the world, that's, that's a level up yet from writing good, maintainable stuff. If you can do this, you'll probably get a job. Tony says, probably the best job. So this again is his scale. If you remember nothing else from it, remember this, once you have things working, you're not done. Once you have it working well, you're still not really done. If you can't add on to it later, um, then you've really just kind of created a nightmare. I mean, good, good getting that far. I mean, I'm not trying to discourage anyone who, who recognizes, hey, that's me. Am I terrible? No, you just have room to grow, right? That's cool. Your peers and your future self will thank you if you figure this out. So if you consistently hit all of these, people will probably, many people at least, will continue you uh, a senior developer, but there's a little more to it than that. And there are also just other ways of looking at it. So kind of a brief definition, it's not exactly a definition, but actually a pair of questions. If you were, say, hiring a senior developer, you might want to ask a couple of questions about the people that you talk to. First, how much direction will this person be? Can they be relied upon to solve problems and get work done with minimal supervision? I think that's something that everyone has in mind when they think of a senior developer. Secondly, and perhaps less obviously, how much direction will they be able to provide to others? Are they helpful to other people? It doesn't end with taking care of your own stuff and delivering things. You need to make the team better. You need to make your peers better. You need to be a helpful human being. More on this as we get into our actual definition definition. Um, and at this point, I have to switch to Keynote. So part of why we're even, we even started thinking about this thing uh, by we, I mean Miles and me. Miles is the other partner in front of us. Is what we do is really senior developer consulting. Like rent a senior developer, sort of. I hate putting it that way, but it's not an awful way to look at it, I guess. Um, and it's helpful to us, not just in hiring, but in also decide, kind of charting our own career paths, because we're still growing too 
to really nail down what we mean by this, what, what the ideal developer that we may not even be ourselves is in our heads. Um, and we found this blog post, I don't remember when, um, from a company called Frontside, called the Conjoined Triangles of Senior Level Development, which is a silly Silicon Valley reference. But um, we really liked this definition. They determine seniority like this. The intersection of how well a person works independently and leads, how technically capable they are, and how well they connect and contribute to a larger community. How well a person works independently and leads, i.e. leadership, how technically capable they are, i.e. technical capability, and how well they connect and contribute to a larger community. Community or connectedness, um, they put in some contexts. So at the center of this Venn diagram is the mythical senior developer. But each of I knew I was kidding. Check. Holy crap. So that button is mute and then get louder. <laughs> but each of these three things has a junior to senior track of its own. If this is beginning to sound like a lot of work, good, it should, because it is. So let's take a closer look at each of the three tracks. The obvious one again, technical capability. No one is under any illusions that a senior developer shouldn't be very capable from a technical perspective. But what does that really mean? A person with high technical capability is technically curious, tackles problems without giving up, and produces solutions that less experienced folks can use, maintain, and learn from. Technically curious, tackles problems without giving up, and produces solutions that less experienced folks can use, maintain, and learn from. Writing code that only you can understand and maintain is not doing anyone any favors. That is not how you win friends and influence people. Notice what is not on this slide. Has every API memorized. That's not what it's all about. I mean, that's nice too. But we all know you can look stuff up, right? Reading the docs maybe should be up there. But um, tackles problems without giving up, technically curious, I think that encompasses that. It's, a, it's still not very easy to find, but it's a little easier to find someone who has a whole lot of APIs memorized, but who has no curiosity to, to go past where they are right now. They've learned all they care to learn, and now they just want to get paid a lot to keep doing what they've done a million times. And that, I, I don't want to say that's worthless to me, but I'm probably not going to hire someone like that. You have to be curious, you have to keep learning, because if you've been doing this for long at all, you know the tools you use today are not going to be the tools you use in 10 years in all likelihood. And 10 years ago, I guess, is about the time we started using Rails, actually. But holy moly, was it different then. So different. So any questions about what we mean by technical capability? I'm kind of making a face suggesting that you don't have any questions, right? But no, seriously, do you have any questions? Okay. So, moving on to leadership. A person with leadership skills knows how to develop and follow a sense of purpose in themselves and others. And we said earlier, uh, we kind of lump leadership into the ability to work independently. So they're willing to point out, own, and fix things that are broken about their organization and in their own career tracks. The third trait, and perhaps the least obvious, connectedness or community. And a person with community skills has a sense of being part of a larger whole, a desire to contribute, and a sense that the other people, their coworkers, users, clients, are not simply characters in his or her own movie, but fully realized individuals. That, so that's connectedness for community. And that's pretty hard to come by. Um, and I think it takes a lot of maturity to develop. Um, 
at, at one point in my life, I probably would have said that this almost can't be learned or taught, but I, I no longer believe that because I've seen it happen. Um, but and it, it may not be obvious that this is really part of being a senior developer, but the more people I work with, the more convinced I am that this is true. It's really hard to consistently deliver good work and keep people happy without having this sense of empathy, really, I think you could redefine this as. You know, a sense that the other people are not just you know, the characters to help you on your hero's quest or whatever, but recognizing that you know, they have feelings and stuff, and like they go home and do other things, and they don't just, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do anything. It's possible James did. He disappeared, and now he's back. Oh, thank you, James. No, it was a, uh, it was, it was the evil uh, enemy that we were fighting during the presentation. But I will say, its absence is kind of freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a nice white noise machine. Now I hear everybody shuffling. I hear a little snoring coming from somewhere back there. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is all really part of what it takes to. And this is when I said, not just as a developer, but kind of a person, I think both the leadership and community pieces apply to almost any job if you want to really excel, or to you know getting along with people in personal relationships and so on. It's just a good idea to, to get used to this idea. Um, and I'll be frank, very few people reach the senior level in all three categories. Uh, very few people even want to reach the senior level in all three. Um, at Fretless, we follow the same measure as folks at Frontside who wrote the blog post where we got this. Um, if someone has reached the senior level in technical capability and one of the other two trades, and is at least mid-level in the other, then we consider them a senior developer. Um, certainly, if you take nothing else from this whole talk, remember technical capability is not enough qualifies as, as, as a senior in our world, and just to, to really be a full, well-rounded uh, developer and human being. Uh, no one with mad technical skills wants to hear that, but in our case, we really can't deliver the kind of product we need to based on technical skills alone. For one thing, if you, if you ship the greatest code in the world, but you alienate everyone around you, they're all gonna quit. Yeah. Um, so really super not helping. Um, so we work with our employees to identify the areas in which they're interested in improving and trying to help them make a plan um, to work on those things. Um, I'll tell a story about someone who used to work at Relis. <laughs> who was sitting right up here in front. Um, so we hired someone straight out of a coding boot camp once, um, which may seem strange for a place that pretty much only hires seniors. Um, but if you, in, in his case, he was super high on both the leadership and connectedness. Also, he showed up to his interview super high. But he was so good at losing his He was very, he was very strong in the other two areas. And, and frankly, from a, if you take away the software development, um, aspect. It was actually super strong on technical capability. Um, it's just that you know the technical area he had previously studied wasn't code. But after going through a boot camp and doing some self studying, um, it was pretty clear just from from um, working alongside him and building some stuff together that that he was going to get there kind of freakishly fast. I always liked it say disclaimer results not typical for this person but um but the truth is good news for career changers who've been doing something else for years and then decide to become developers late in life all that other experience is still relevant because some people who've been developers for 10 years and just never bothered flexing those other muscles maybe further behind than you are because you can get, catch up with the technical stuff faster than they can learn how to um, 
recognize the humanity of their peers in some cases. Um, <clears throat> Ah, oh, cuss. So they're from an HDMI cord. Not that there's much to look at at this point in the presentation. Um, so that that really is the presentation um, in a nutshell. So you know, the way the way that we looked at this, connecting this our community, technical capability, leadership, they're all really important in building the well-rounded developer. As you dig into the technical capability piece, remember that curiosity is important. Um, working through problems, don't give up. Uh, write solutions that less experienced folks can learn from. Don't always just try to do it in as few lines of code as possible. And the other developer who reads your stuff who thanks you may be you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. So it's, you can do, I, there are well-known ways to test technical capabilities in a job interview, which is like, tell someone to do the foobar test or something. How would you say you can test connectedness and leadership in an interview? Not to be argumentative, but I would also argue that some of the ways that people try to measure technical capability in an interview are not very good at actually determining that thing. Um, that's actually a really hard thing um, because to some degree you're, if you ask them to you know reverse a link list on a whiteboard um, which I did to someone in the first job interview I ever gave because I, I had no idea how to do it and I googled technical interview questions um, luckily he also googled technical interview questions and so he had to do it. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that's not maybe as easy as it, anyway, what, was, what I was going to say about that is to some degree you're just testing their ability to do that under pressure on the spot on a whiteboard, which is not really the conditions under which they'll be working. So that's actually harder, harder than it sounds. Um, how can we measure the others, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Is that the actual question? I'm gonna replace my original question and say you can, you can look at someone's technical capability by looking at their GitHub profile. <laughs> That helps. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so connectedness and community, actually, contributions to open source are part of that. Um, not that it's even necessarily a requirement that you have a bunch of open source contributions, but if you do, then that is certainly some evidence of connectedness to a larger community. Um, but some of that you can just get by, by chatting with someone. Um, are there any fans of Blade Runner or do Android stream of electric sheep? You know the Voigt Kampf test? So in an in interview with someone you can say, you're in a desert and you see a tortoise on its back. But you can kind of tell just by conversing with someone if you try to try to relate to them as a human being, um, ask them questions about times that they've helped other people or what they've learned from, from their mentors or whatever. Um, sometimes you can kind of get a clue of that. Anybody, anybody have a better answer yet? I, mean, I was gonna say, I feel like that's a lot of the reason why people tend to hire from the net their networks, right? True, they, right, they know this, right? Um, they've had the chance to <clears throat> learn that sort of through osmosis through like many years. So. You've attended NDRB. <laughs> but it's hard to interview, right? so. Yeah, it is, it is, it's hard to find that out in an hour. Um, one thing we've done with all of our previous hires actually is hire them as contractors first, um, which really gives you a chance to um, gauge all of those things. And another nice thing about that is they get paid while they're jumping through your hoops because it, it annoys the heck out of me when I hear that like part of what they had to do uh, as part of an interview process is like do the job for a day and not get paid for it. I kind of think that's bull crap. Oh, I'm sorry, there may be employers in here who totally agree with me. Sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so you know, hiring someone to do a small contract is actually a pretty helpful way to tell all of those things. Because another another way that the community thing can kind of manifest itself is commit messages. If your commit messages are, if you write them like no one's ever going to read them, then you're kind of being a little selfish and lazy 
um, by just trying to get the thing shipped as quickly as possible without thinking about the fact that someone else is going to have to try to figure out what you did later, and that person may be you. Um, so actually, I consider um, commit messages another window into that. Yeah, if you get picked up by that Twitter account that uh, only tweets uh, GitHub, open source GitHub commit messages with curse words in it. <laughs> <laughs> Stumbled across this account day before yesterday. <laughs> it's kind of awesome. And it's just mild CS all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I still, I still abide by uh, Tim Pope's git commit message guidelines. I just insert the F word in every one. <laughs> <laughs> Joel on software, uh, Joel, which is Joel Spolsky, had a blog post from probably 15 years ago right now, I don't remember, um, where he talked about his time at Microsoft as like the Excel product manager. And um, he, had been, he had a code review with Bill Gates, like Bill Gates actually coming to a meeting Let's print out of his code. And he was told ahead of time, you tell how well you're doing by how many times Bill says the F word. If he doesn't say it much, you're doing great. <laughs> Working for us is not like that, FYI. <laughs> right. You may have noticed I've been saying things like, I think I said Cuss Ranger earlier. I'm not, I'm not a too, too uh, heavy a user of profanity, personally. I would say maybe the lightest. <laughs> I'm probably, I'm probably tied with some other people for the lightest. Miles, do you make up for it? I do make up for it, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's, we've got a... <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Not a question, but uh, you were asking for additional people to chime in on that one. Oh, okay. So, I mean, it's very true what Daisy said, and I've actually done a fair amount of interviewing for positions that were not developer, but for where the other parts were actually very important. And uh, so it's true that they're just completely different competencies, so there's a completely different set of questions for those. Um, so just asking questions that relate more to interpersonal skills and things like that. Um, let's see, what's some favorite ones? Um, like. More like giving them a chance to tell stories about how they do these things. Um, something like, tell me about a time you went above and beyond for a customer or a teammate. Like questions like that, that really give them an opportunity to. Um, you can pretty easily pick out whether they've actually done those things, um, and you can really pick up on these other things from those types of questions. And anything that gets them telling a story also gives them plenty of opportunity to say things like, well, all the people I worked with were a bunch of jerks. And in and, and other, other situations where it sounds like they're blaming everybody else for all their problems, or where they just complain about people nonstop, mm -hmm. that's not a great sign. Mm -hmm. um, I actually knew someone who, um, <sighs> and he told me about this afterward, um, I think out of embarrassment because he realized pretty quickly what he had done. They, they asked the standard question of why are you leaving your old job? And he said, well, I didn't like the people. <laughs> and they said, well, you have to work with people here too. If you think everyone else is a jerk, you might be a jerk. Uh, Chris? One other source specifically for that is like social media. Like, one, like follow somebody's Twitter feed if they're constantly bitching about their job and about the people they're working with. That's a pretty good indication. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. Lots and lots of cases. Mm -hmm. That's why, like, um, when I was doing a lot of hiring, I actually didn't always post job. It was more I was constantly looking for people to hire so that I could follow them and sort of stop for a little while and just see, like, well, what do they bitch about all the time? What do they complain mm -hmm. about? Do they know what they're looking at? Um, <laughs> well, I think you think you want to. Yeah. Um, and that, that sort of stuff, when you get a window into that, like get commit messages, Twitter, like that sort of stuff, it can really give you sort of an insight into uh, what, what they're thinking like and what they might work like. Uh, reference is also really kind of handy for both of those. Like, even if you don't ask the person directly, when you call up the reference, say, what was it like to work with so and so? Do you have any stories of so how they helped you out? Um, to the social media thing too, um, I knew another person who applied to work at the place I was working at the time, and I had actually kind of put in a word for him, and then he didn't hear back right away after the interview, and he tweeted 
something something along the lines of couldn't couldn't even bother and like named the employer like couldn't even bother to call me back f you like oh my gosh man <laughs> wow well they're certainly not calling you now <laughs> neither is anybody else who knows your twitter handle <laughs> yeah. wow um for for hiring managers in the room or people near that sort of thing uh there's a site manager-tools.com which is a terrible domain name it's a whole different conversation um <laughs> Uh, but they, you can subscribe uh, to manager-tools.com. Uh, that's a dash, not the word dash, by the way. And, and it's really a hyphen, not like an m-dash or an in-dash? Shit. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so aside from manager-tools.com, I'm not even going to bother. Uh, manager-tools.com having a bunch of great podcasts and other information. They actually have this tool that I feel like they don't advertise enough um, that... It's a it's like an interview question tool, and you uh, like essentially create a position, and then it has this questionnaire for you that is like how important on a scale from one to five are these qualities, and it has like forty, at least forty different qualities that it asks you about, and you rank them on a scale from one to five, and it's very specific about the requirements. So like you can't have everything be a two; it will it will complain to you and say you can only have six twos and you know, four fives or whatever. In any case, you go through this whole thing and it then generates like 10 to 20, I can't remember, questions for you based on how you ranked those different qualities that are intended and supposed to get the, the interviewee talking and indicating um, where they might land on those qualities. And you can ask those questions and it'll tell you like they're weak in this area if they hit any of these sort of um, bullet points, you know, during this story. They're strong in this area if they hit any of these bullet points. It's a pretty cool tool. Um, even, it, it is called Manager Tools, and it's actually aimed for, like, managers hiring managers to some extent, but you can still, you can still pick and choose some really cool questions that are useful for interviewing really any sort of position. Any other questions for Davey? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, um, Kind of the flip side of his question, um, his question is about how does one ask for, you know, how do you determine if somebody has the connectedness or leadership attributes? Um, the flip side of that is um, how does one develop those kinds of attributes? And you said connectedness I used to think was inherent, but now I think it can be learned. Um, I mean, aside from Wheaton's Law, which everybody should know, don't be a dick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How does one, that's, that's baseline connectedness yeah. and leadership, um, how does one improve on, on that? So just as in order to become a senior developer, you have to define senior developer, in order to avoid being a dick, you must first know what a dick is. <laughs> um, so when I was, when I was 20, 22 or 23, um, and in, actually in my first job out of college, um, I had a group of friends outside of work. And there was one person that nobody could stand. And one day we all got together and he didn't show up. And so everyone started complaining about him and talking about all the stuff that they didn't like about this person. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I did, I I was kind of a little turd, and I didn't know it. Um, so you know, self awareness in that area is actually a big part of it, and part of part of how I I helped to become a little less of a turd or a polished turd, as it were, um, <laughs> was by kind of. First of all, just watching very carefully as I spoke to people and like looking for those little cues um, that I just that I just offended someone um, and had no idea or like and they, that can be something as little as I interrupted them um, and I I kind of didn't even realize I was doing that but I kind of saw that little um, you know or, what, or whatever or that sharp intake of breath or whatever. Um, so being being very observant of interactions between you and other people, and even between other people, 
um, I think helps a lot there. Um, because in that, in that case from when I was 22 or 23, um, watching someone else do a horrible job connecting with other people actually helped me get better at it because like, okay, do not do those things. And I think I do some of those. Um, Seth, would you like to, you, you have some stories in this area. If you, would you wanna talk at all about, about that, how you improved in that area? Yeah, I can. Um, you don't have to. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, uh, that face did not say it's fine. But it's <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe you, but you're kind of dead to me now anyway. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, for me, it was, it was a combination of things. Um, I think a big thing was um, being around people uh, that had the skills that I wanted. And I think you probably know some people that you know, just have an easy time getting along with people or that you recognize as a leader. And uh, really just going to them and uh, those type of people are generally open to helping you as well. Um, you know, so I would, uh, for people that I admire in their ability to like deliver feedback, I would ask them if they would mind sitting in while I gave somebody feedback and then just ask them afterwards, like, how do you think that went? What could I have done better? Um, that, that really helped a lot for me. Um, public speaking as well, like trying to, you know, deliver a message effectively to a team, uh, have somebody that could do that very well, sit in on those things and then give me feedback afterwards. Um, that, a combination of uh, the feedback, um, reading about it, honestly, helped a lot too, understanding the concepts um, and then just practicing. Uh, one thing that helped me a lot with it was, um, putting myself in situations where I couldn't use the skills that I was most comfortable with, um, which has always been technical capability for me. So seeking out situations where technical capability couldn't be a crutch for me, I had to use the other skills, uh, helped a lot too. Like not allowing yourself to rip the keyboard away from the other person to just fix the same problem yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Forcing you to use your words to help the other person actually achieve it. Like literally sitting on my hands so I couldn't be the one typing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, th that all that stuff requires a huge swallowing of your pride because no, it it's really easy to want to argue when someone gives you feedback in those areas, right? Yeah. Um, it tells you tells you that you're not good at dealing with other people. No one wants to hear that. And you always have a, de a defense. I have another resource, actually. Um, mm -hmm. He made a joke about it, actually, earlier. Uh, there's a book that lots of people hate. Uh, most people hate it based on the title alone, or they hate it because they saw it sitting on the slimy salesperson's desk. <laughs> there's a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, yeah. And it is more like how to communicate with people in a nice way. Like, it is, it is a really good book. It's ancient, and there's some, um, there are some things that are not cool today, like there's some sexism in there, uh, because it is an ancient book, and he was not, uh... It's a product of its time. Yes, thank you, Jesus. In any case, uh, um, for the most part, though, it is, it has a lot of great tips, a lot of, like, Think about this when you're talking to someone. Like, don't um, you know? Don't don't think about you know uh, what you want to say next. Pay attention to what they're saying. Think of a question to ask them about what they're saying. You know that sort of stuff. Um, it's a good audio book. There's a good audio book on Audible if you want to do it that way. Um, and it's in print. You can find it at any half price in the bookstore or the style place that you want to go to. Yeah. I'll, I'll second that. It's a good book. It's been years since I've read it, but yeah. I just reread it, actually, and uh, I was like, oh yeah, this book's, I should probably reread this like every six months, just keeps on this shit. You'll be surprised who told me I should read it. Oh, did I? No. Who? <laughs> Somebody that uh, I used oh, to work for. Okay. And, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. See? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you get in trouble. Yeah. We'll talk later. Yeah. I didn't know they could read. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? All right. Well, thanks. That was a lively conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.